Welcome to the Startup Grind. Okay, so welcome everybody and, um, and welcome Monica. <laughs> so, so Monica, I mean, I, I've known you for, for quite a while and um, I probably don't know everything about you though, so perhaps you know, this is a good opportunity to dive into some of the bits that, particularly around becoming an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. you found interesting for yourself and also for the wider audience. But um, what, what I do know about you is that obviously you grew up in Sweden, mm -hmm. so you're a Scandinavian. Mm -hmm. um, your parents were diplomats and you traveled around quite a lot because your parents were diplomats mm -hmm. and um, including many different countries, particularly in your teens, including Asia and, mm -hmm. and etc. What do you think that meant to you and, and what sort of influence did growing up in Sweden and then being somewhat movable with these diplomatic parents, how, what sort of influence do you think that had on your future life mm -hmm. and, and what you're living today? Mm -hmm. Well, it's true that they were di they are diplomats and and but but it's also traveling has very much been in, in the blood of our family i, I would say uh, it's something that we as a family have loved to do together and it and it still today continues to play a very central part in in my life uh, and you know you've got the adventurous part of traveling which is great but but what i also think is so important is it, it presents us with an opportunity to really grow and, and to just by experiencing new cultures, new people. I think there's massive learning uh, when we travel around the world. And this is something that I also am very consciously passing on to my son. Um, so yes, did travel around a lot and, and this inspired me to, at a very early age, think that I wanted to live abroad one day. That seed was planted early on and uh, I was very fortunate to come to Hong Kong uh, when I was 14 years old. And Hong Kong as a 14 year old had a massive impact on me. I was blown away by the dynamism, by the pace, by the energy. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to live here one day. I had no idea, of course, how that was ever going to happen. But, uh, but this is the wonderful thing when you're a child and you believe in magic and you just know inside yourself that I'm going to live here one day. So, of course, ma of course a lot of influence uh, in, in my life, this, this whole traveling part, yeah. You went to university, obviously, mm -hmm. and um, if you're anything like me, I couldn't wait to get mm -hmm. out of education and get into the real world. I wanted to earn money, mm -hmm. I wanted to start my career. Um, were you the same and, and did you even know at that stage what you wanted to do in life? Mm -hmm. So very much like you, Dave, and, and, and unlike a lot of my classmates who, who I just felt are going to hang around in university forever, uh, I was very impatient. I am very impatient and, and I wanted to get out into the real world very quickly. Yeah, I wanted to make money, I wanted to climb the corporate ladder and I was very sort of... Uh, career focus around this whole corporate thing. So already at university, I think I had a, a vision of that I really wanted to make it to the corporate top, that that was kind of my goalpost. Um, so it's interesting because um, you talk about corporate and obviously my background's corporate as well, so I mm. understand it. Mm. Um, but you joined what I would call almost one of the ultra aggressive parts mm. of the corporate world. You joined the telecom sector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The telecom sector, for people who aren't aware of it, obviously, very male dominated, mm -hmm. highly competitive, mm -hmm. very aggressive, results focused, it's all about the bottom line. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did you find that being a, obviously a young woman mm -hmm. going into this sort of very male dominated world, high pressure, results focused, you know, what, what was that like mm -hmm. at, that, at that age? Well, first of all, it wasn't a conscious choice. So I, I think like so many of these early life choices, when we make our sort of first jobs and stuff, we, we, it's not conscious that we're actually going into a certain sector. And it certainly wasn't for me, so it was coincidental. Um, but it wasn't until I joined that I actually realized uh, that the telecom sector at that time was going through a massive transformation from being sort of very old dinosaur incumbents uh, and it was, they were transforming themselves into sexy organizations and the organizations of the future which were going to revolutionize the way that we communicate. Because obviously when I joined, nobody I knew had a portable telephone. So, so it was a fantastic time to join. And so we're talking the late 80s now and, and you're right, at that time 90% of my colleagues were men. Uh, the women that were there mainly held secretarial positions. And so I, 
I resolved to myself very early on uh, to, to let go of any beliefs I had about that gender imbalance or how that would in any way uh, hinder my progress. Uh, I wasn't going to become a victim in this man's world. And uh, so what I did was I kind of rewired myself a bit and I started to put in supportive thoughts like, what an opportunity and with all these gray suits because all my colleagues were wearing gray suits and more or less looked exactly the same and I saw that as a great advantage for me to be able to sort of stick out. And, and those kind of thoughts, they, they worked well for me in that type of environment, yeah. Very good. I know you spent seven years there and you did build a pretty successful career. Mm. Um, and then one day you said, that's it, uh, I'm, I'm done with this and I'm going to move to Luxembourg. Mm. How does that happen? Mm. Explain to me how yeah. this, this, this all the, the light bulb moment occurs and yeah. you decide that you're going to go of all places to Luxembourg. Yeah. So I started my, my telecom career actually in Sweden and, and then I moved to Hong Kong and I did spend seven years there. And so, so I did realize my 14 year old dream and, and, and spent some of the best years of my life in Hong Kong, both privately and professionally and, and did advance my career uh, in, in a major way. But you know, so this was kind of in 1996 and uh, Hong Kong was going to become part of, of uh, China again with 1997 happening. So it was a very anxious time in Hong Kong at that time and nobody really knew what the outcome was going to be. And I started to feel anxious as well and it was time to, to, to make a move. And what happened was that I had a Luxembourg supplier in the job that I was doing and uh, had built up a very good relationship with this Luxembourg supplier. And the Luxembourg supplier wanted to grow their market share in Asia Pacific. So with the experience and the contacts I had out there, they offered me a job to come to Luxembourg as regional manager of Asia Pacific and to grow their Asia Pacific business. So, you know, in taking that job and doing that, that was a pretty smooth transition between Asia and Europe because I had one foot in Asia and one foot in Europe for, for something like three years. Uh, so that's how that happened. Mm. So, so you, you came over, you were still in the telecom sector, you were still a successful yeah. executive. You'd, yeah. you'd, you know, you'd spent those, whatever, 14 year dreams, um, building yourself up to be this, uh, this against the stream, mm -hmm. the, the, this, this successful woman in an aggressive environment. Um, and then you, you landed in Luxembourg to do this job, but something changed. Mm. What, what happened to you? There, there was a, a major moment in your life where you decided to mm. just do a U-turn a little mm. bit, right? And I think, and I think what, it, what it particularly was for me and was that sort of climbing this corporate ladder and, and, and joining these very executive positions, very high level, uh, probably due to certain naivety as well, but I, I wasn't prepared for um, how politically intense it actually became. Uh, you know, I found myself in this, at, and we, ne we need to remember this was at a particular time in the telecom sector and in the environment that I was finding myself in, but I was very much being sidetracked into meaningless office politics, power struggles, and found that I, you know, this was having a compromising effect on my principles and values. And, and to be honest, this, this had a very demotivating effect on me and, and it really started to break down my spirit and, and I, lost my, I lost my joy to come to work. And so all of a sudden I felt, wow, this is not really what I want to do anymore. There must be more to life than, than, than the corporate bottom line and increasing shareholder value. But, but what is it, you know? And, and I thought, I want to do something which has a human touch. I want to do something that is more meaningful. But, but what is that? I, I don't know what that is. And being exhausted, working, you know, a lot of hours, you, I, I found I didn't have time to think. So I decided to leave corporate world. I was close to burnout. I was extremely unhappy. And uh, I decided to leave and give myself six months to figure out what's next. What do I want to do? It's, uh, it's, it's interesting because... Um out of that six months of reflection, mm -hmm. I know you said you wanted to do something to deal with people and, mm -hmm. and whatever, but um, and, and I, was, I was there at the time, um, you decided to become a coach. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going back quite a while now. At that time, the word coach was really only reserved for football coaches or professional sports coaches, right? It didn't exist in, in the corporate world or in, in the sort of the, the, the human 
um, development world mm -hmm. at all, mm -hmm. right? It didn't exist here in Luxembourg. Absolutely no. not. Well, mm -hmm. even, in, even in more developed countries mm -hmm. like the UK, it was mm -hmm. still a very nascent mm -hmm. term and, and it, it was a little bit nebulous. It, no one could really... It just wasn't used in, in the whole sort of learning development um, arena at all. How did that happen? How, how is it that after six months you wake up and you say, I've got it, I'm going to be a coach? Because mm, it, mm. it's virgin territory a little bit, mm. right? People don't even understand what it means. Mm. No, that's true, that's true. But, but let me just, just say this first as well, because I think this is an important aspect. It, it was never in my plans uh, to start up my own company. Never, ever. It was never on my radar. Uh, I grew up in, in a family of entrepreneurs and I had sworn to myself as a very young girl that I would never start my own company with the massive commitment and sacrifice that that, that took. So starting to even think along those lines, uh, I, I thought life can be so humorous sometimes. I, and, and, and it made me also realize never say never. But, but yeah, so coaching wasn't known here. I, I was abroad in, and this was in midway through my six months reflection time. And I happened to pick up a brochure that had the word coaching on it. I didn't know what coaching was. I knew what it was in the sports world. But, um, and when I, read those, when I read that word, my heart started racing. And I thought, I need to find out more about this. What is this? And coaching resonated with me for a number of reasons. It resonated through its positive focus on goals and personalized strategies, taking into account as human beings, we are all different. It resonated with me because I would have loved to have something like that myself, certainly in the more senior years of my career. And it resonated because it's a leadership style based on, on really human values and, and human touch. So there it was, you know, I'd found it. I found what I was looking for. And uh, one thing led to, an, to the next, and that really propelled me on this journey that, that resulted in setting up Luxembourg's first coaching company, which is Coach Dynamics. Yeah. I mean, some, some would say that's a pretty bold move, pretty brave move. Mm. So not only have you walked away from this career that you've expended an enormous amount of energy on, you've, you, you've dedicated yourself to, you've made it as a woman against, against the, the, the tide, you've come to Luxembourg, you're, you decide to become a coach, in brackets, mm. that, that most people don't even know what that means. Mm. That's, that's a bold move, right? Mm. And, um, I know what it's like to leave the corporate world, mm. and it, it's a real step mm. to, to leave that comfort zone. Everything mm. you build up is security and, and whatever. Um, your friends and family, mm. how did they react to this? I mean, you must have got mixed, mixed reactions from mm. people. Some would think you've gone completely bonkers, mm. and why would you leave a successful career? Others would probably admire the, the, the fact that you've been brave, that you're going to do mm. it, and, um, mm. and the inspiration that that, 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 that leads to. I mean, I mean, you know, were you excited, frightened, mm. um, self-doubting, a mixture mm. of all of those? I mean, mm. what, what did it feel like? Well, you know, I, I, that, you know it's, it's so true what you're saying there, because, because when, you leave, when you leave the corporate world after so many years, you, you really are leaving your comfort zone. And, and, and for me, it, it was a real mixture of emotions. And, and, you know, on the one hand, you feel really free and you feel hopeful and, and you know, you've left it, you know, this big stone has fallen. But... But on the other hand, you feel pretty freaked out because it's like, okay, so now what, you know? And, and you've become used to having the corporate brand behind you. You know, it defines you as, as a professional, uh, in your part of your professional identity. And, and when that brand gets taken away, uh, you really need to reinvent yourself professionally. And, 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 that, and that can be scary as hell when, when, when you realize that. Friends and family, and, and this is really, this was so interesting for me, and it was astonishing actually, because as it turned out, um, almost nobody supported this. Uh, I was met with incredible skepticism about, uh, first of all, what is it? And why are you going to go out and do something that nobody even knows what it is? Um, Luxembourg isn't ready for that, so are you nuts? And how can you throw away this successful career in telecoms? Because, you know, once you've left, you can never come back. And, and this was my favorite one. But who do you think you are to believe that you can coach others? So there I was, and I thought, oh, my God, everyone thinks I'm making a mistake. And this is where you, you really need to do some soul searching. Uh, you need to go away by yourself, and you need to ask yourself some of these questions. And, and get the answers from within yourself. And that's, that's what I did. And, and, and I thought, okay, 
with all these fears and doubts around me and inside me, because it's scary as hell inside of yourself as well, is this still what I want to do? And the answer came back like that, yes. And so in that moment, I resolved myself to stop hanging out with people who were not supportive because it was difficult enough as it was. And, and I want to mention something really important here. It is so crucial to have people in our lives that believe in us. And particularly so when you go out and start your own company. Uh, even if it's just one person. And the one person who always believed in me and had complete faith in me from the day I came home and told him that I wanted to become something he had never heard of. And as if that wasn't enough, I wanted to set up a company around it, is, is my darling husband. Uh, and so that support has been just tremendous and, and uh, continues to be that, of course. Yeah. No. So, so you've, you've got some support, limited support. <laughs> limited support. Um, you decide, that's it, I'm going to do it, because you've got self-conviction. Um, very quickly, though, um, Coach Dynamics is born, and so is your son. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so now you've got a few things going on, right? You've got mm -hmm. all this energy going into Coach Dynamics, mm -hmm. pioneering the new field, explaining to people in the first instance what coaching is mm -hmm. all about, let alone even embracing it. Um, you've got a new, a, a, a new child as mm -hmm. well, a husband. You've got to balance all of that. You've got to juggle that. Mm -hmm. So you could say almost, you know, it all came all at once, effectively, mm -hmm. in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, what was that like? Was it, was, it, was it relatively easy for you or was it somewhat arduous, full of self-sacrifice, constant juggling, keeping the plates spinning? I mean, what, what, what were you living for, for, for those first couple of years as you got all of this off the ground? Because obviously you were trying to balance building a, a pioneering actually, a, a new career and self-discovery with keeping a family going and a young baby. And I often think back at that time in my life, and, and, and I really think about it as the time in my life of my two pregnancies and giving birth to my two babies, because uh, that, that was really what it was like. But, you know, starting a new business is, is, is never easy. Pioneering a new business is never easy, and coaching was certainly no exception. There was a tremendous amount of networking, obviously, that I needed to do because nobody knew what it was. Uh, I had to, you know, I felt like a parrot in the end because I had to repeat myself over and over and, and, and kind of explain what it was, what are the benefits of it, and that it wasn't therapy, and, and so there was, you know, and, and so endlessly doing that. And I think when you, when you do try to pioneer something or set up something, you do, you need, you need big doses of courage, you need big doses of self-motivation, uh, perseverance, and, and because, you know, it's like having a good idea and being passionate about it isn't enough. Setting up your own business requires a lot of hard work, a lot of commitment. And, and uh, I was talking to somebody earlier here when we were networking. You're probably working harder than you've ever done in your life, but, but you're doing something that you're passionate about, so it's worth it. Yeah. And juggling, yeah, I mean juggling, you know, sadly the day doesn't have more than 24 hours, <laughs> but you know. So constantly juggling. So, so I mean, I, I know um, that you work incredibly hard and, um, and often under social hours, mm. having in my previous life received emails at 11.30 at night mm. and stuff like that from mm. you. And you also, you also hold yourself to incredibly high professional standards, mm. which, me, which includes turning stuff around on time as well as to the quality you expect. So mm. that, that's a huge demand even in the normal environment for mm. someone that works nine till six, for example, right? Um, and you're still doing that today. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you balance being a solid professional, continuing to grow, service clients to your highest professional standards, and still be a good wife and mother? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? What, what's the trick mm -hmm. that, that you've developed for yourself? I'm not going to comment on the good wife part, seeing that my darling husband is in the audience, <laughs> so I, maybe that's a bit, uh, hmm. But, um, but you know, be, being, being a high achiever, um, I've really learned over the years and understood how, how important it is to keep your eye constantly on life-work balance. And life-work balance means different things to different people. And we all need to find our own strategies to be able to cope with life-work balance. Uh, I've been close to burnout uh, a couple of times uh, over the years. And so today I'm wiser. Um, I have a lot of respect for my limits. I understand what my limits are today. 
So I place a high degree of importance on my planning and to make sure that you know, it somehow works and, and that I get that life-work balance right. It's, it's nothing that you ever do once, you tick the box and then you've done it. It's something that you always have to keep your eye on, adjust, plan again and, 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 and look at it. Yeah. Yeah, it comes constant fine tuning to continue. It really does. You've got to look after yourself, basically. You really do. Yeah, because nobody else is going to do no, it for you. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, what next? Uh, what, 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 what's, what's next for you? More coach dynamics, expansion. Um, where do you see um, your life going in the next five years? Mm. From 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 a, from a professional perspective, mm. what, 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 where are you in terms of the? the evolution of coach dynamics? Mm. There's a lot of ideas on the table uh, right now. There's a lot of exciting ideas on the table. So, so it's still very much onwards, upwards, you know, this constant sharpening of services, this constant new ideas, and there's a lot of sort of evolution. Um, I, I will say one thing that, that uh, there's one thing that I really learned in corporate world and I've taken away with me into my own business. And, and that is that you can never afford to become complacent with your success. Uh, you always have to remain humble and you always have to remain grateful for it. And you, you need to continue to develop yourself, to reinvent yourself uh, in, in order to, you know, not become stagnant and, and really be at the forefront of your business. Uh, this is what I think is, is really key. Mm. Mm. Yeah. There's obviously some people I'd like to think in the audience that have thought about becoming entrepreneurs or having their own business, so if not now, but maybe in the future. Um, if there were three messages, key messages that you had to deliver to someone thinking about becoming an entrepreneur but maybe a little bit hesitant, mm. um, what would those messages be? Mm. Uh, the, the first one would be, how badly do you want it? Do you, how badly do you want it? Because, and and this, this really, this needs to come from your heart. Uh, because it's not, it's not a brain exercise. Uh, because if you don't truly believe in it, truly, then how are other people going to believe in it? The way you talk about it needs to be contagious uh, in a way. And the second piece of advice is get the business plan done. How does your idea translate into viable business? It's a fact that more than 50% of all businesses fail in the first year and that is because there is no business plan the business plan is a fantastic thing to do because it really focuses you on what it is that you want to do and it makes you really think it through from all kinds of perspectives and the third is never ever ever give up don't give up keep going because there are going to be times of great triumph and and, and there are going to be times when you just want to throw in the towel and give up and I think the key to success is, is to never give up what you really believe in and to understand that success doesn't happen overnight. It, it, it happen, it's a one step at a time. And I want, I want to share with you a, a, a wonderful quote uh, from actor Morgan Freeman, who, as those of you who know Morgan Freeman, know that he became famous very late in his career, very late actually. And he has said, the moment you give up is the moment you fail. If you never give up, you will never fail. So, very good. Those are my three points. <laughs> Indeed. That's all I wanted to say um, as the interviewer uh, to Monica. Thank you very much. Um, we're open to questions. Yes, yes. So, um, yes. Don't be shy. Any, anything, um, <laughs> we'll give you an honest answer, either of us, but particularly Monica. Obviously, she's one in the, in the chair. <laughs> so, um... Praise Alexander, I'm looking at opening my own coffee shop and corner shop. I've got a business plan for it, and I've done extensive work for it. But I want to put this case to you. What if you're stood in front of a location, maybe a premise that isn't ideal, maybe it's about 80% of the solution, put your business in, how can you I network, negotiate, get around this problem to make it foolproof that you can have this qualitative good business that you're going to then start up? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> 
I don't know, you, you, you really, th this is why the business plan becomes so important, because it really allows you to look at this from all the different perspectives. You know, there's no one answer to that question. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if, if it was well, me, I, I, would, I would chunk it up a little bit. And again, it comes back to the business plan. So I would, you're never going to get anything perfect. Right? And every entrepreneur starts a journey, and they think they're going to go to there. Invariably, they never make it. All right? Not because they failed, but as they've gone along, mm. they've veered, and they've seen other opportunities, and they've, mm. they've zigzagged a little bit. Mm. Right? Mm. And you think you're going to end up there. You actually end up here. And you, it's, mm. probably, it's not wrong. It probably is mm. better you ended up here in the end. So you have to stay open to those opportunities. What I would say is if it's 80% right, that's probably good enough to start. Mm. You just need to make sure your business plan and has the appropriate triggers mm. to find the next step so you get to your 90% mm. and your 95 But you know what? You're never going to have the 100%. Mm. It's just not going to look the way you initially thought it was going to look. I, I, think, I think that's the fair, you know. Yeah. We all have this, this vision of this road that, that, that we put out, and, and, and it's about being open to maybe I need to go this way, maybe I need to go that way. What could that look like, you know? Yeah. It's a bravery um, thing. It's about commitment, hmm. right? If you wait forever for the conditions to be 100%, you'll never do it. Yeah, that's also very true. You won't. You'll be searching and searching and searching, and opportunities will pass you by. So at some point, you just have to say, do you know what, like, like Monica did, like I've had to do, I'm just going to do it now. Yeah. Believe in myself, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to make it work. Hmm. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, you said it's about your job. You said uh, coaching is definitely not therapy. Yeah. Well, th therapy is very much going into, you know, maybe old traumas that you have or, or really deep emotional issues. Uh, so it's very much looking into the past. Uh, coaching is very much forward looking. It very much takes the view, here is where I am today, here is where I want to go, and how am I going to get there? So, and it's got a very positive kind of focus on goals, helps you really to define what it is you really want and to, and to really define those strategies on how to get there. I said also, you know, at the outset that one of the principles that really attracted me to coaching was this fact that as human beings we're all different. There is no one way of doing something. And that becomes apparent. I usually use the example of two salespeople who are absolutely brilliant and bring in, you know, the same amount of revenue. If you're looking at what those two salespeople are doing to bring in that amount of revenue, they'll be doing very different things a lot of the time because they're able to do it in a way that, that resonates with them. And when you do things in a way that resonate with you, you'll, you'll achieve great results. Um, and coaching is really about finding those strategies, you know. And that's done through a lot of questions that maybe you haven't always asked yourself, but that you certainly have the answers to most of the time when you're being asked those questions. Yeah. And that's such an interesting question, actually, because you always, you always tend to put you know, the bar pretty high, and, and you're always kind of going for the next thing. And, and I, remember, I remember one day where, where you know, I think we had, we'd had Coach Dynamics for four or five years, maybe, when, when, I, when I felt now Coach Dynamics is established on the market. Now I feel that, that you know, we're really a player to be reckoned with. And, and, and that had a lot to do with, with uh, the client list that I had managed to, to, uh, to sort of build and grow over those years. And when we were getting you know, certain press coverage and, and stuff like that, and were being referred to as a reference in the market, that, that was the day when I felt, yes, now, now we're established. Now a lot of people know who we are and, and, and come to us spontaneously. And how do you celebrate? Well, you try to cork up bubbles. You try to remind yourself to cork up a bottle of bubbles uh, when, when you have any kind of big wins because it is important to celebrate. It is important to, give your, to stand back and to give yourself credit for the accomplishments that you do because you need to nourish yourself 
to continue to go. There's no one else to motivate you, so you kind of have to motivate yourself. And, uh, but that, that part is very important because it's easy to get lost and just go for the next and the next and the next and the next and, and not stop. That's a good question. Yes? Um, the situation at the moment almost seems to be, as a potential observer, that companies become, corporate worlds become incredibly effective at doing what corporations need to do, like making money, and making the top line and making the bottom line. And as they get better and better at doing that, it becomes worse and worse for the people who actually have to work there. And maybe you're, you're two really good examples of people who've done everything you can do in the corporate world, nothing more to do, and got out and looked at uh, new challenges. I'm interested, do you see a place in, in trying to bring that back together again, bringing humanity maybe back to corporations? Do you see a place for coaching in that? Maybe right up at the very top of the organizations to try and bring, uh, to try and bring the, the, the goals of the corporation and the people that work for them together. Mm. With a coaching approach. With a coaching approach. Yeah. I think there is a big desire of this. There's certainly a lot of talk about it. Um, I think in Coach Dynamics we've been extremely lucky because even though there's been a crisis, we have continued to grow year on year. Even when training budgets were slashed, we were still continuously in demand. Um, so, and I think that's because there is a realization of sort of the longer term benefits of coaching and there is a keen interest also in, uh, in kind of adopting more of a coaching, coaching culture. But you know, this is a journey and, and I think certainly with the crisis, a lot of the corporate uh, environments have become very negatively affected by the crisis. Um, a lot of them are borderline toxic and it's going to take real commitment from the leadership teams uh, to really start to transform these cultures into cultures that do have more of a human touch. I, I think it's absolutely right to use coaching as a, as a vehicle for this. I think coaching has so much to offer. I think we can all do it if we just have a willingness to do it. Uh, so there's a keen interest, but it's a journey. And uh, I certainly feel very privileged to, to now since four or five years work quite extensively with leadership teams. And so what you're talking about is, is one of these themes. No. On a human aspect, I mean, as a child you said that you would never want to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. And you ended up being one. No. What would you advise your son? No. Because he obviously is now experiencing a mother who's an entrepreneur. Mm. And obviously your son would also like to make some money when he's mm. studying. So how would you see that cycle evolving? I think, I think that's an interesting question because I'm doing quite a lot of research uh, currently on Generation Y. And as it turns out, Generation Y, I think here's where we're really going to see a lot of entrepreneurship uh, because that seems to be really on their radar, uh, much, much more than it was on, on us exes. So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if that actually ended up happening. And uh, I'd, I try to... I, I think maybe the difference is, and I, God, I hope my family doesn't kill me now if they ever watch this, but uh, I try to give more maybe attention to him uh, and, and maybe try to work around more quality time uh, even in, in my entrepreneurship, which, which I think you know, a lot of kids that grow up in this environment maybe don't get that much attention. And that's why as a kid you don't really want to, yes. you know, so... Mm -hmm. Any more? Everyone's ready to become an entrepreneur? Got no <laughs> doubts or questions? <laughs> Yeah. My savings account. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Because, uh, because I had to re-educate myself, um, re-educating re yourself and certifying yourself and going through all the courses costs a lot of money and, and so a big bulk of the money was put into, uh, into my training and development to become a coach. Uh, 
and then of course as you know you don't go plus for the first uh, I, I think it was one and a half years or something like that before you before you really start to feel that you're you're making money and so all that time you have to draw from somewhere <laughs> so I think a lot of us are drawing from our savings or we go out and find money. I, I didn't want to ask anyone for money. I didn't want to fi find money because I really, if I was going to take this step after what I had experienced, I was going to do it my way and not have anybody else kind of dictate the terms. That, that, what, that became extremely important as well. Yeah. My, I, I spoke about doing something that, that your heart really beats for and, and my very first client was I was at a cocktail party or a dinner or something like this and I was you know I hadn't started yet I knew what I was going to do but I hadn't started and I spoke so passionately about this thing that I was going to do and I was talking to this guy and, and, uh, and, he, so, and all of a sudden he says to me wow that's really interesting I've just been promoted to director level I would love to have some of that when can we start and I thought, oh my God, I'm not ready, I'm not, uh, but then I thought, oh, I'm going to take this opportunity. So I just obviously coached him for free, but just to start with someone. And so private clients, I was able to start getting quite quickly uh, just by talking about it. I was doing an awful lot of, lot of networking. And so by talking about it, it, it was like that. My first corporate client I got uh, through an interview that I had done at a the time there was a public, an English publication called the 352 and we got a full page article in that one and that started triggering actually some phone calls from some uh, company CEOs who had heard the word and, and were interested in what, what is that word, you know, what does it actually mean uh, so, so that's what happened I think it is, you know, I, I think it's, it's very popular, it's very trendy, yeah, but I don't think it's a trend that's going to die out. I, I think this was a lot when I was going to start this, a, a lot of people kept saying, you know, it's going to die out, you know, give it a few years, and, and I don't see any signs of it dying out. I keep seeing every company that we go into, I keep seeing ripple effects, and, and so I, it, you know, normally we go into a big corporation, we start with a couple of pilots. And, and I would say 95% of the cases, that always keeps giving us more business. Because the benefits of coaching are so long lasting. Uh, when they've done studies between training alone uh, and training with coaching, you, you really see the productivity gains that you get. And, and, and just how, you know, it's, it becomes, it's stickier, it sticks into the mindset because you're doing coaching over a longer period of time and not just a one-off. Yeah, there is. And, 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 and uh, so I, I don't see it as something that's come here and that, that it's going to go. Uh, I at least see no evidence of that. Not here in Europe, not in the States. And I just see it growing in Asia now as well. Uh, so it's like everywhere it touches, it just tends to grow. In the big four, and my no, well, two of the big four are actually clients of mine yeah. <laughs> since many, many years. So uh, that's not their core business. You know, even even their advisory part, um, coaching would not, you know, touch. Maybe, in, if you look at PwC Academy, maybe that they would have a, a little module on it. But but they are not professional coaches. So I, I would not see them as competition. Yeah. Obviously, I'm not the only one anymore, so there are more companies out there. And, uh, 
But, you know, I think there's place for everyone. There's enough business for everyone, and that's how we have to view things. I, I think competition is good. It keeps you on your toes. Uh, it comes back to not getting stagnant, which is so extremely important. Uh, so, yeah. We'll probably see more competition coming in, I'm sure. If it's anything like the recruitment companies in Luxembourg. <laughs> so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this first lunchtime event. Uh, we are curious about your feedback. So you can drop the feedback uh, per email just, uh, to see if you can give this kind of uh, events or if you proceed to a little different ones. Uh, again, that, thank you very much, Monica and David for playing the part today. And uh, thank also for Lux Future Lab for hosting us and our partners without who uh, startup up right maximum would not be possible because we are not really an organization and initiative, so let's call it like that. And these partners are BPM so that you can reach us by mail, mail postal mail, mix for it, that you can reach us by phone. So thank for that. And if you like, I would invite you to the other room again to have uh, to grab the rest from the lunch and or you can go uh, to the next week. Thank you very much.